throughout Luke Skywalker's life, he has been faced by some of the darkest forces that the galaxy has to offer, being forced to fight against his own father as a young adult, and being tasked with rebuilding the Jedi Order from scratch shortly thereafter. Perhaps his most iconic and outright devastating defeat was against the might of Darth Vader, in which his right hand was severed by the Dark Lord, causing him to lose both it and the iconic Skywalker blade in the process. While we know the lightsaber survived the fall and lived to fight again under Rey's control, what happened to the hand of Luke Skywalker? Surprisingly enough, the fate of Luke Skywalker's hand had far more serious ramifications on the wider galaxy than we had previously been led to believe. So stick with us today, students of the Force, and let's explore the tale of what happened to Luke Skywalker's hand. First, it's important to note that we will be both discussing the Legends continuity explanation, as well as what little we know about the hand in canon. Though we cannot be entirely sure where the stories definitively overlap, only where they don't. The recent run of Darth Vader number 11 showcases a new addition to the modern Disney canon, helping to explain the background of Emperor Palpatine's cloning experiments that ultimately led to his return on Exegol. Here, this story follows Vader's life shortly after the battle on Cloud City, and his subsequent conference with the Emperor, where it is revealed that Palpatine was able to recover the severed hand of Luke. After finding Luke's hand on Bespin, Palpatine had it transported directly to Exegol, the home of his brand new cloning experiments and the heartland of his Sith alchemy. This clandestine base of operations was the central hub for all of Palpatine's dark side experiments, from his genetic alteration to the eventual Strandcast program that would result in the creation of not only Snoke, but Rey, as well as the clone body that Palpatine would inhabit. While this run is as of yet incomplete, the comic seems to have significant implications for not just the creation of Snoke, but the return of Emperor Palpatine as well and it could all have to do with Luke Skywalker's hand. We don't know how many experiments the hand was used to conduct, but if Palpatine used Luke's hand to make a strand cast of himself, this amalgam between his DNA and the Skywalker bloodline might be eventually revealed as the being known as Snoke, though we cannot confirm that this is what the writers are building up to as of right now. All we know currently is that Luke Skywalker's hand is being used in experiments on Exegol. But what exactly do we know? As of now, we know that Snoke is in fact a strand cast product of Palpatine's experiments in a semi-successful attempt to clone himself. While we previously took this to mean that Palpatine exclusively used his own DNA, this storyline seems to challenge this original idea, and might explain why Snoke didn't entirely resemble Palpatine despite using his identical DNA. This could potentially mean that Snoke was both a Palpatine and a Skywalker as far as the genetics can confirm, but again, we have yet to see this be formally confirmed in the modern canon. In Legends, however, the explanation is a bit different as to the fate of Luke's hand, as it was discovered by a renegade dark Jedi by the name of Jorah Sabaoth, who used the hand for similar purposes to Darth Sidious in canon. In this storyline, Joris was not actually the original iteration of Jorah Sabaoth, but was a clone by Palpatine using the DNA from the former Jedi Master, creating a genetic copy with the same innate force sensitivity and prowess in the Jedi arts. Where the clone differed, however, was that this version did not have the same mental stability as the original Joris, and was prone to bouts of uncontrolled aggression, and showed early signs of insanity and severe mental and emotional trauma. Sidious, however, was able to mold this new iteration into the perfect acolyte for his uses, training him in the ways of the dark side in order to expand his armada and employ another student of the dark side, despite Sabaoth not being the most mentally reliable. He was not a true Sith apprentice, as the rule of two ensured that Vader remained Palpatine's only student, but nor was he an Inquisitor. Instead, he was something different entirely. After the collapse of the Empire and the rise of the New Republic, Sabaoth was sent into exile, bouncing between Imperial factions as the galaxy was thrust into disarray amidst Palpatine's death. It was here, though, that Joris came into contact with the former Imperial commander and the legendary Chiss warrior, Grand Admiral Thrawn. Thrawn, who had also managed to survive the dismantling of the Empire, now led his own faction of loyal followers and Imperial sympathizers. In the year 9 ABY, roughly five years after the Empire collapsed, Thrawn and Sabaoth met for the first time and began to discuss a mutually beneficial partnership. It was revealed that Thrawn had established a foothold among the Imperial factions that were still operational, and these remnants remained loyal to Thrawn and his sole command. Thrawn, being the incredibly versatile versatile tactician that he was, had formulated a plan to overthrow the new Jedi Order with the help of Sabaoth. 
promising that he could then take the unborn children of Leia Organa as students in exchange for taking Luke Skywalker captive in the process. As their plan progressed, however, Thrawn began to see the cracks in Sabaoth's mental stability, watching him descend further into madness as a result of his imperfect cloning creation. Here, Thrawn had a decision to make, weighing the logical advantages to keeping Sabaoth on board, and he eventually decided that Sabaoth was a complete liability. Thrawn is known for his logical approach to various militaristic situations, not allowing emotion or compassion to cloud his vision of what must be done, and this meant that Sabaoth, as powerful as he was, was an illogical inclusion. Instead of continuing their alliance, he ordered Sabaoth to be locked up for his own protection, but the plan involving Luke Skywalker's hand had already been set in motion. Using tissue from the discarded hand which he had been able to recover from Bespin, Sabaoth was able to repurpose old Kaminoan-based cloning operations to create a clone of Luke, complete with his iconic blue saber that he had found alongside the severed hand. When Luke Skywalker and his team eventually arrived on Mount Tantis, where Sabaoth was being held, he and Mara Jade came into direct conflict with this clone of Luke, who possessed the original same level of force sensitivity and had a natural affinity to lightsaber combat, again similar to the original. Despite his genetic template, however, the clone was ultimately defeated by Mara Jade and killed on Tantus. Not long after, Sabaoth also meant his ultimate fate as he was killed at the hands of a force sensitive smuggler and died that fateful day within his own prison, leaving Luke, Mara Jade, and their allies to escape relatively unscathed. But anyway, my friends, and students of the Force, what are your thoughts on what actually happened to Luke Skywalker's hand following his duel with Darth Vader on Bespin? And now confirmation that both Star Wars Legends as well as Star Wars canon had stories revolving around Luke's hand. More importantly though, do you think that Luke Skywalker's hand was used to create Snoke, or was it used in other experiments on Exegol? And what do you think Darth Sidious's ultimate plan for Luke Skywalker's hand was? Do you think that Snoke could potentially have some Skywalker DNA latent within him. As always, my friends, thank you guys so much for watching the channel. May the force be with you, and I will hopefully see you in another video.